Hello, and thank you for joining us today. I hope you're as excited as I am to hear the latest upgrades and improvements to our modeling and simulation software platforms. Now, before we get to the innovative science, a few housekeeping items. We take your privacy rights seriously, and by attending this webinar or participating in the Q&A session, you're allowing us to contact you for further follow-up. And as a disclaimer for today's talk, we will be discussing forward-looking statements, so please refer to the Safe Harbor Statement for more details. Now, at any time, you may ask questions via the Q&A panel on your dashboard at any time, and today's moderator will address the questions posted there after the sp final speaker session. Now, I'd like to quickly run a poll to learn about you. So which modeling and simulation approach are you primarily using or will be using within the next six months? If you could go ahead and pop in your answer, we'll give you just a few more seconds here. I know all of today's speakers are very excited to get started. All right, and let's see who everybody is and what they're doing. All right, so it looks like 60% of you are in the PBPM and PBPK modeling space with QSP modeling coming in second. All right, so let's get back here to now the introductions. Our panel today, when he's not rocking out to the Tower of Power, Scott Q. Seiler, our Chief Scientific Officer of Dilly Sim Services, is leading the QSP and toxicology efforts within Simulations Plus. Hi, Scott. Thanks for joining us. Also known as the Texas 42 Domino Champion around here, Matt McDaniel joined the Dilly Sim team as a software developer and QSP QST modeler. Currently, his focus is the conversion of the Nafelsim platform from MATLAB to Julia, which he's excited to share with you today. Thanks for joining us, Matt. And Corey Berry, our senior software engineer, working hard on the next-gen development of Dillysim software. He's popped on camera, and now he's spent over the last 10 years working with both commercial and government agencies to design, develop, and deploy end-user software. Thanks for joining us, Corey. And while he's not training for marathons or supporting partially sighted athletes in their marathon journeys, journeys, Neil is going to guide us as the Vice President of Simulation Sciences at Simulations Plus, driving and guiding the development and application of PBPK modeling software tools. Key activities for Neil includes pestering Brett and Scott on webinars like this, as well as supporting the drug product development with PBBM modeling. And last but certainly not least is today's moderator, Dr. Brett Howe, President of Dilly Sim Services, a division of Simulations Plus, which is responsible for developing and using Dilly Sim and QSP modeling software tools to improve the development of safer and more effective drug therapies. Now, Brett, I know your favorite movie is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. And with the high temperatures this past week, are you wishing for Christmas weather in July like I am? Absolutely. Great. Well, let's get it started. All right. Well, thank you so much, Arlene. And thanks to all of our panelists for joining us today. Um, we are uh, going to start here with a little introduction to Simulations Plus, if you're not familiar with us as a company. We are a modeling and simulation powerhouse of a company uh, with expertise in chem informatics, uh, PBPK and PBBM modeling tools, clinical pharmacometrics tools and solutions, as well as quantitative systems modeling. Uh, and we have, I think, a very unique mix of the right scientific experts um, with the right experiences in these areas to help those who are developing drugs and therapeutics move those drugs and therapeutics through the pipeline faster and more efficiently, but also an emphasis on helping companies um, do it in the most efficient, cost effective ways to really help businesses thrive in this space. So we're a very unique company in that way in terms of all things modeling and simulation. We also have a very strong focus, um, not only on people and science, but on products. 
and we have a number of flagship household name products, those such as Admet Predictor in the Kim Informatics space, which is an excellent property prediction tool. It's also very well and tightly connected with our PBPK platform, Gastro Plus, widely used by the pharmaceutical and other industries. Um, we also have a clinical pharmacometrics platform with our monolith suite, which is gaining traction rapidly around the globe. And we have a, a whole suite of quantitative systems modeling tools, such as DILISIM for drug-induced liver injury and NAFLD-SIM for NASH and NAFLD efficacy um, and target prediction. So <clears throat> at Simulations Plus, we have scientific experts. We have excellent products. As a company, our vision is to improve health through innovative solutions. And our mission is to create value for our customers by accelerating R&D, by cutting costs, by helping with efficiencies. And so we thought what better way to really um, aspire to and achieve this vision and mission than to share some of our technological advancements, some of our latest and greatest uh, software tools, capabilities, and really also allow those of you in the audience to hear from our experts in this area um, um, as well on today's webinar. So we wanted to really focus in today on three critical tools, um, three tools that are in interesting places in terms of the product development life cycle, and really give those of you in the audience a view of where the tools are, um, what are some of the you know interesting um, points of uh, thought from our leaders in development, and also understand where our technology is going in terms of next generation here at Simulations Plus. So the tools that we'll cover include the DILISIM platform. This is our quantitative systems toxicology platform focused on combining in vitro mechanistic liver injury data with PBPK predictions of liver exposure to predict impact um, in, in the clinic and on the liver. NAFLD-SIM is our mechanistic mathematical model of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which can be used to predict efficacy for treatment modalities for NAFLD and NASH. Um, and Gastro Plus is our world-renowned mechanistically-based simulation software package that simulates a whole host of different delivery routes um, in the biopharmaceutical space, simulates pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics in humans, but not only humans, but also animals. So we're going to touch on each of these three platforms in different ways today. Um, we're going to have a relatively um, loose and relaxed, fun environment sort of a fireside chat, if you will. And uh, we're gonna get started first with DSX. Um, so let's start with Corey Berry. Um, Corey, uh, if you wouldn't mind, tell the audience um, both where you're located in the world today and also uh, a little bit about your role here at Simulations Plus on a day-to-day -day basis. No problem, Brent, thank you. Um, so I'm Corey Berry. I'm located now in the North Carolina area. Uh, close to the offices for RTP. And my main role here at uh, Simulations Plus, the Dillisim division, um, is as the primary developer for the uh, DSX, Dillisim um, X uh, software platform. Um, and so I'm the um, primary developer for the, uh, the user interface and a lot of the backend services for Dillisim uh, X. So. Thank you, Corey. That's yeah. great. So a few questions for you, Corey, before you give us a little sneak peek demo of uh, the DSX platform and let our users see it. Uh, what aspects of the next generation DillySim platform do you think the users will benefit from the most? So I think the best um, example, well, I think they will benefit uh, most from the cross-platform nature of the tool set. Uh, we're using Qt with the C++ um, and um, we're in creating a user interface that can work cross-platform on Linux, Windows, um, and even Mac. Um, and so I think they'll benefit from that because it'll be available on more uh, on more systems. And also from the speed of C++ as well. It's um, many, many times faster than um, the MATLAB version. Um, and the deployment of the software should be much easier this time um, because there's no need for a um, um, runtime or anything to install for uh, the, the uh, application itself. So uh, there's several um, benefits of using this platform that's built on C++ and Qt. Yeah, that's great. I know as a software user myself, there's nothing more frustrating than 
um, installation snafus or, uh, you know, slow simulations. So uh, improving in those two areas is going to be a, a, a great advancement for us. Um, Corey, why was C++ and Qt chosen for the DSX implementation in particular? Well, it was chosen for, like I said, for the speed and also because um, we can we can basically take that um, the um, application that's built with C++ and we can uh, run it on white clusters and um, uh, back in um, large servers and things like that. And also, uh, we also wanted to try to link in with the simulations plus the main division because they're using C++ as well. And so we'll be able to connect up and integrate in with uh, GPX at some point in the future. So um, it just seemed like the best language to choose to try to connect a lot of different similar uh, ideas. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And how about web compatibility? Does this new platform enable um, web compatibility in the future, for example? Yes, since we're using Qt, uh, Qt has a lot of um, built in um, web connectivity uh, that allow you to use like WebAssembly to kind of port your application over to a, a, a web page. And so that's a potential use case for the application in the future if we want to like uh, ship it to a web page and uh, allow more users to use it without installing. So which it was uh, the language and the uh, tool set was chosen as a so we can possibly use that feature in the future. Great. Well, before we get to the the uh, the sneak peek at DSX, which I know everybody's excited about, the last question for you, Corey, what was what has been the most challenging um, aspect of converting the Dillysim platform over into C plus plus and Qt? Primarily, it's been trying to translate the way the code was written in MATLAB over to a more object-oriented uh, C++ uh, method. Uh, so as you, as you know, uh, MATLAB is really just more of a scripting language. So a lot of things had to be re, re architect and re-implemented over in C++. And that took a lot of time. And I guess second to that would probably be the user interface as well, uh, making sure that it matches a lot of the same features that's over in MATLAB and making sure that it, it works as expected by the user. Awesome. Well, speaking of that user interface, Corey, why don't you take us through and give us a little sneak peek, give our audience a sneak peek at what they can expect as we get DSX out to the world in the coming weeks. No problem. I'm about to share my screen now. Then. All right, we can see it. Okay, excellent. So what I'm gonna do now is start up the main application. As you can see here, this is the licensing login screen. Um, I'm already licensed, so it has my name here at the bottom and it tells me how many days I have left for my license. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit the continue. And right now what it's doing is loading a lot of the data that will be used throughout the application um, and just storing it in memory. And so it takes a few seconds to pop up. And here, what you're seeing is the main user interface, um, the home screen in the main user interface. And I'll explain a couple of uh, windows here, what's going on here. You have a resources that links to different um, uh, pages, web pages, and even uh, help documentation. Um, over here on the right-hand side, we have like the latest news. Um, and that's an RS, RSS feed uh, from the Simulations Plus website that shows you the latest news and updates about related to Dillysim. And here at the bottom, I have like the recent simulations that have been ran um, and it allows you to open folders to view the results from those simulations. And so moving over here to the left hand side, this is the main menu bar that you see here um, And each. Um, as you can see now, we're on the home tab for this menu. Uh, so you can use your mouse to scroll down and select different tabs um, and I'll go through a few of these and kind of explain what they do. Um, the sim singles tab. Um, allows you to define and run sim singles. And so here we have this list that shows all the different sim single configurations. And over on the right hand side, we have the different um, parameter sets that you can uh, set to uh, apply to this to an individual sim single. And this matches uh, pretty similar to how it was done in the MATLAB version. 
it's just organized slightly differently. So now you can have, you have the ability to add multiple sim single uh, configurations, each with its own set of parameter sets. Um, next, we have the sim pops. Um, here is the same sort of setup. You have a list of sim pops um, and you can define uh, different properties for each sim pops and, and even be able to run it from here. And that's one thing I didn't mention. This button right here, if you click that, that'll actually run this particular sim pop. So each, um, and that's the same, that's true here for sim singles as well. You can just click this button to run directly. Uh, moving on down, I have a run list, and this is the um, parallel run list feature from the MATLAB version. And here you define a configuration again, and you can select which sim singles you, you wish to run, and you can push them over to this uh, selected setups. And so you can just define out a configuration list of um, simulations to run. And this includes sim pops, parameter sweeps, and sim singles. Um, next, we have the sweeps window, and here you can see it follows the same um, uh, view as the other features. You have this, this list of configurations on the left-hand side, and the configuration options are here on the right-hand side, and here we can define um, a sweep for, for this particular configuration. And finally, we have a monitor, uh, and this allows you to select a set up clinical monitoring for uh, to use with, with uh, sim singles and you can just define a list of them here but each one of them you can uh, define different uh, variables that you can use to um, like well, apply different conditions and apply modifications for those conditions um, but what i'll do now is i'll go ahead and run a sim single to um, kind of show you the next uh, user interface that you will see so I'm going to select the human APAP 32G here at the top. And again, I'm going to click this run button. And what it'll do is save in the background and then open up the simulation window. So the simulation window here, um, and I'll explain a few things of what's going on. At the very top, we have these three boxes. Um, the system usage just shows you how many threads you're using with the simulation, how much uh, memory you have that's being used and how much disk space has been used. Uh, with sim singles, you're always gonna typically use one, but that number could be different with like sim pops. Um, this middle window is telling you the actual um, simulation time, and it lets you select if you wanna save binary, um, Excel output, or save both. And finally, over here on the right-hand side, we have the simulation status, and as the simulation is running, this shows you what's completed, what's saved, and what failed. Um, and this is even more useful for sim pops. Uh, moving on down, we have this window here, the sim single selection shows you which the options that you selected for the sim single, the parameter sets you selected. And this middle window shows you um, just, just a visual of what's, uh, what kind of simulation this is. It's a human uh, male simulation, and it just tells you it's ready to start. And over on the right hand side, we have a few buttons. Some, most of them are grayed out initially. Um, you have this workspace folder that's available. And this folder, this option will open a folder that shows you where the results are for this simulation. Um, so right now I'm gonna go ahead and run this simulation. And I can do that by clicking this run button at the top. And so one quick thing about this, we have a run button and we have a debug button. Uh, the difference is the debug button will check for issues with the solver and it will quit as soon as it finds any errors within the solver that occur and it'll print that error out. Um, it runs a bit slower in this mode, but it does help with debugging. Um, but the actual run is right here for this first, uh, this first button here. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that. So I clicked the button and now we have the timer is running and it's the simulation is initializing. Um, we also have this view at the bottom, like you, you can see the progress is going there and now it's saving. We have this uh, log view at the bottom. If you click that, it shows like a backend log from the actual solver, different things that were printed out um, at the low level. Um, if I go back to the progress, you can see that it says complete. And now over here on the right-hand side, I have more options available. Uh, what I'll do now is go ahead and view the results. 
So I'm gonna click the view results button. And so this is the results viewer. Um, so we have two tabs over here on the left hand side for this menu. We have the sim single, which allows you to view like the plot for the sim single. And we have the eDish plot here. I'll show you the eDish plot. And so this is similar to what you'll see in the MATLAB version. We have the um, eDish plot um, split up in this way. And we have the, um, the um, symbol here in this normal range, as you can see with this little blue plus sign in the bottom uh, left. So going back up to some single, um, the way this works is you just, we have an independent and a set of dependent variables that you can select. So I'm gonna drag this independent variable here and I'm gonna just drag uh, one of these uh, dependent variables. And so this right here, I have two different modes. This shows you the um, data behind the scenes for this. And this chart option shows you the actual chart. So you can see here, this has this has no data in it. So um, there's nothing there to show, but if you wanted to keep adding items, you can. So if I wanted to add uh, this gut lumen compound, again, that one has nothing. Um, if I go on down and just choose something different, you said we have all the variables listed here as well. And that's one thing to mention, these variables um, correspond to the output panel that you select as well. In the uh, in the uh, sim single, so as you see, there's a lot of nothing going on in this simulation. But you can see how, as you add things to the list here, it um, <clears throat> creates a table here for you to uh, see the actual data. Um, so I'm gonna close this out. Close out this window, and so <clears throat> excuse me. A couple of other things I will show are the settings inside of here. So you can actually change a few of the visual settings of in the in the UI. So if I hit the settings button, we have this um, the ability to change the theme. Um, as you click these different buttons, you can change the color. You can have a dark mode. Um, you can also change uh, how the actual menu looks. If you want to hide it, you can hide the menu totally, or you can switch it to small icons. Um, so I will go ahead and show you that, and I'll go ahead and change the theme to this dark rose. So I hit apply, and I'll reset, wait a few seconds, and it'll come back. So when I log back in, you'll see that the theme has been changed to the, um, the more dark theme. And it's, it kept the settings for the uh, menu on the left hand side here. But yeah, I believe that's all I wanted to show for my demonstration. All right. Thank you very much, Corey. It was exciting. And uh, DSX is certainly going to be great to use going forward. Um, mm -hmm. Before we move on to NAFLD Sim, I believe Arlene is going to come in with a poll. Arlene? I do. Thanks, Corey. To our audience, as a potential user of Dilly Sim or DSX, would you be more likely to use the command line version or the graphical interface? Take your pick. Give me just a few seconds here before we move on to the next speaker and presentation. I liked Corey seeing the progress uh, screen and the log in the background. That was pretty cool. All right, here we go, Brett. Uh, looks like the GUI comes out on top. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Arlene. Well, let's move on to the NAFLD SIM software tool. Uh, for that, we're going to turn over first to our chief scientific officer of the Dilly SIM group and the lead architect of the science within the NAFLD SIM platform, Scott Seiler. Scott, how about telling our audience where you're located in the world and a little bit about your day to day duties? Sure. So I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area in California, and uh, where it's going to peak at 73 degrees today. So eat your heart out, those of you in North Carolina. Uh, <laughs> and um, as the chief scientific officer, I have my hands in many pies, I think, if I'm, uh, or pots of jars of honey in the Winnie the Pooh analogy. And uh, essentially, kind of almost all of our scientific programs, I have some participat participatory role. Uh, several of the programs, such as NAFLD NASH, I am uh, essentially the leader. 
All right, well, let's jump right in. What aspect of the next gen Naffleton platform that Matt is going to show uh, excites you the most, Scott? It, it, there's a lot to be excited about. But before we talk about the next, I want to talk about the current. Because one of the things about Naffleton and Nash is we're learning a ton as all these new treatments are being rolled out. And we have had kind of two things happen in parallel with Naffleton. One is <clears throat> it has shown an impressive amount of kind of consistency with these emerging clinical data from the various phase one, phase two, phase three clinical studies. Whether they are successes or not successes, um, we're really doing a nice job of predicting all of the above. Also, as is often the case in these situations, there are aspects of the NASH pathophysiology that are being revealed by some of these new uh, treatments. Uh, and for example, a reduction in, in fibrosis stage within 12 to 16 weeks of treatment, you know, 10 years ago was thought of as a complete impossibility. And as of, you know, the last 18 months has been demonstrated multiple times. We have been able to kind of uh, continue to uh, tinker with parameters, if you will, update Maffold Sim uh, in order to be consistent with those sorts of observations. In other words, to iterate as the science and the understanding evolve. So all of that has been phenomenal. <clears throat> Again, really nice and consistent, will be carried forward into the, the next versions of Naffold Sim. The, the, on the science side, really nicely advancing, and now on the tech side, also really nicely, nicely advancing. One of the things that you'll see here soon is just a remarkable increase in efficiency um, with which simulations are performed. By that, I mean the simulation speeds are really noticeably faster and you know, transformatively, really. Um, will really accelerate a number of different aspects of the QSP model. <clears throat> Great. Um, so what what tends to make Naffold Sim, you talked a little bit about speed, what tends to make Naffold Sim, you know, difficult to solve um, as a platform? Sure. It, it's, um, in fact, I think this is a good opportunity for me to actually share my screen so that, because um, I think some slides will illustrate this point nicely. So, you know, one of the aspects about NAFL and NASH <clears throat> is that we have multitude, kind of four, if you check the color coding, a uh, key the separate but related pathophysiologic areas, <clears throat> and they operate on quite different time scales. So, for example, um, the lipid partitioning really, uh, you know, operates on kind of a minute to minute, hour to hour time scale. In, in an example being kind of the change in plasma glucose with meals. Whereas if we move over to kind of the, the inflammatory aspects, those, the changes in cells, for instance, in, in macrophages takes on the order of days to weeks. <clears throat> Collagen in the kind of the backbone of the fibrosis component is notorious for having some of the slowest dynamics in the human body. And sure enough, it takes to years um, and so keeping track of <clears throat> each of these aspects, each of these dynamics within one model, which is required for us to evaluate all the various treatment modalities that are being evaluated, you know, inherent in all of this is stiffness. And so, uh, you know, kind of the next generation, if you will, approach to calculating all that is required as, as a consequence. So I, I will kind of now illustrate to you, I'm going to steal a little bit of um, our next presenter, Matt's thunder. Um, we've done a lot of testing just to kind of benchmark uh, how well um, Julia performs relative to kind of the, the original MATLAB version of Nafletson. So again, you know, uh, speaking to the, the stiffness that's built in, so to speak, uh, the disease, certainly it takes a fair amount of time to run simulations uh, within MATLAB. You know, whether it's 24 hours, whether it's 52 weeks, whether it's three years. And there are various scenarios where these are pretty commonplace uh, durations. And then the number of simulated patients to accommodate that, you know, kind of depends on how many core processors you have, how much time you have, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so in the 2021A version of MATLAB, you can see the results um, for each of these three categories. Now, those same exact same simulations run in Julia were uh, completed six to eight times faster um, than the MATLAB version. Again, that's a transformative increase in performance that allows us to 
consider you know, a number of additional, not only to perform the work faster, but to consider a, a number of additional aspects, not the least of which is continuing to build out our cadre of simulated patients. You know, 1,700 SimPOPs patients across a, a wide variety of NAFLD and NASH um, um, inter, interpatient differences is great. You know, we can potentially even expand that further. Fantastic. Thank you, Scott. Well, I'm mindful of time, so I think we're going to move to Matt McDaniel, who is leading the development of that very platform that you showed those numbers from. So, Matt, um, tell our audience a little bit about where you are in the world and what you do here at Dilly Sim Services Simulations Plus on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. Um, I am located in Tucson, Arizona, so we're topping out about 35 degrees higher than Scott is today, <laughs> uh, but we, we get it back in December. Um, and uh, my role here is uh, I started in uh, started this year, 2022, um, and uh, my role is a hybrid software developer and QSP modeler. It's been more on the software development side so far, which I'm I'm just fine with. I, I like doing it, and uh, gotten to learn a lot about Julia, and uh, it's always always cool to learn a new new coding language and get to use it. Awesome. Well, Matt, you've seen the old NAFLD SIM version, the current, I should say, the current version of NAFLD SIM, and you've been developing this new version. Um, do you think this new software environment and interface improve the user experience? I do, and I, I, I think I have a, a unique perspective on it. Um, but since I started just this year, uh, I was being trained on how to use the MATLAB NAFLD SIM UI at the same time that I was working on the uh, kind of extending Corey's DSX UI to be able to use with NAFLD SIM and with the Julia backend. Uh, so, you know, we were getting everything I think we could out of the MATLAB UI, but um, at some point you're kind of going beyond what MATLAB was intended to, to do. So um, it was interesting, you know, I learned how to set up a parameter sweep in the MATLAB UI, then go over to the QT UI and do the same thing to generate test cases and found it to be you know, faster and also uh, more intuitive. I uh, really like the way Corey laid it out. Um, having the features and the clear tabs and panels really helps you step through the process of setting up simulations. And just I think it just feels overall a little sleeker and, and more modern the way it's set up. Well, it's interesting, um, Matt, that in uh, Corey's demo in, in for DSX, he referenced C++ and QT, but for NAFLD Sim, uh, we've chosen a combination of Julia and QT. Can you give our audience a little bit of a feel for why Julia with QT? Yeah, so um, so as Scott mentioned, um, you know, this is a tricky problem because of the, the stiffness uh, of the equations really makes solving them difficult. And so you would think that a statically typed language like C++ would be the best way to make things faster. But um, for the needs of our customers, uh, particularly or users, particularly with respect to keeping our model equations open and editable so that users can, um, you know, make changes, introduce new equations or parameters, and just kind of explore different simulations. That's much easier to do with a dynamic language uh, like, you know, a Python or a MATLAB. And so Julia is a dynamic language, but um, the developers have really optimized the compiler to reduce the compile time performance hit and they designed it specifically with an eye towards numerical computation, uh, but it also can be used for more general software applications. So it was a very good fit for us. Um, and the great thing is that you can save a pre-compiled session in a system image. And so what we've been able to do is save a, a session essentially with all of our required libraries and any um, you know, imports we need with all the engineering code required, that's saved off in a system image. And then at compile time, we bring in the model equations and then compile them right there for any changes the user has made. And so it combines the best of both worlds and, and the way it Julia packages it all together, um, it, it ships with a Julia uh, binary executable. So users don't need to go download Julia, download all these libraries it's all ported with um, the, the build. Fantastic. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If you're going to build 
um, targets and new molecules into your model, uh, having that capability plus the speed uh, sounds great. So Matt, for the for the hardcore techies out there, do we have <laughs> command line use um, or do we only have graphical interface use with this new version? Uh, we, we certainly have a command line use and essentially what the, since Julia is the, the back end on this, um, we essentially have a NAFLD Sim Julia command line that the UI is calling. So if you wanted to, you can you can skip through the UI phase and with your um, simulations you have set up, go directly to the, the Julia command line interface and uh, and run it that way. Awesome. Well, Matt, we're uh, we're moving on time here. So why don't we cut to your demonstration? If you could give our users just a little peek of, of NAFLD Sim, this, this next generation NAFLD Sim, that'd be great. Yep, no problem. So share the screen here. So what you'll notice, first of all, actually can make sure people can see this here. Now we see it. All right, cool. So what you should notice, first of all, is that this looks very similar to uh, what Corey showed, which is great because we kind of have this common uh, common front end that we can uh, extend different ways. So same tabs over here. I've already set up a demo SimPops to run. Uh, so it's over here. Uh, it's a 16 patients running 24 hours. Uh, so you can see this is a little bit different than the sim single uh, panel that Corey showed. The top is very similar um, using four of eight threads. Um, and then you can see here how many sims completed, did any fail. Um, so right now what it's doing is it's calling to the Julia application and it's setting up a run file for each of the 16 simulations. And see the first four started right off the bat. So it took about 17 seconds to uh, set up those run files, which again shows how uh, the, the pre-compilation of Julia really helps. Um, so each of these patients uh, has different options you can look at. So there's a patient log for each one. And of course that opened on a different screen, but uh, patient one is starting. Um, every single patient, you can see which parameters uh, you used and also what the initial conditions were uh, for every single patient. And, and so down here, you'll see the progress. So four finished, right? four survived, four more running. And I want to point out kind of the difference in some of the performance here. You'll notice these next few pop off real fast. Uh, patient one took about 34 seconds to do 24 hour sim. Um, that is because the equations are being compiled when Julia starts up, they're not pre compiled. Um, however, once that compilation happens once, now down here, this patient, equations have been compiled the first run. Now it only took seven seconds for that patient. And you can see this also, this view here, this shows uh, how much time is spent on each simulation. You can see on each process, there's a little bit of a lag on the first one. Again, that's the price you pay for keeping the model equations um, open until runtime, they need to compile. But once they're compiled on that thread, uh, the next few sims just, just fly off. So you can see how really for a, a longer sim pops, if you've got several hundred patients running for a long time, uh, this initial hit is almost negligible in the, the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Um, and just real quick, uh, I wanted to show, essentially we have this Julia application and there's a public model. So the executable is, a again just like a command line executable you can run but we have these equations that you can edit um, as you as you see fit uh, for for different trials fantastic all right and then i can stop sharing now all right well thank you very much matt it's exciting before we cut to our final speaker and ask a couple questions about the um, interplay between pharmacokinetic modeling and efficacy tox modeling. Let's cut to Arlene for a quick poll. Thanks, Brett. Uh, which potential advancement on the NAFLSIM side would most excite you as a user? I'll give you a few seconds here. Uh, speed, cool interface, run list cap capability, data analyst plotting tool, or the Julia backend? And as you take a few seconds to answer, if you have the need for speed, feel free to drop your email in the chat to a message to marketing to me, and we'll get you signed up with an evaluation. 
So Brett, here's the answers here. It looks like, oh, we've got some numbers. We're between the data analysis plotting tool and the need for speed. So quickly, I'll pass it right back to you. All right, thank you, Arlene. Well, now, uh, last but certainly not least, we're gonna pull in Neil Miller from across the pond. So Neil, tell our users a little, tell our audience uh, where you are in the world and a little bit about what you, what you do at Simulations Plus. Okay, thanks, Brett. So I'm over in the UK. I am in the southeast of England, um, just about 20 miles north of London. So I'm the VP for Simulation Sciences. I oversee the Sim Tech Group that develop our so software, so Gastro Plus, DDD Plus, Membrane Plus, and I also oversee the Sim Studies Group that apply our software for various industries. So it's, it's great to be here today. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Neil. So just a couple of questions for you, Neil. Uh, so from a technical perspective, uh, why will it be easier to merge our QST and QSP products like Dilly Sim and Naffold Sim, which were just shown, um, and our PBPK products in the future going forward? So I think that it will be easier to merge them because of the, uh, the technical compatibility. For example, Gastro Plus, the new version of Gastro Plus is being written in C++ with the graphical user interfaces being created with Qt. And that's exactly the same technology that Corey described for, for DSX. So it's that technical compatibility will make it easier to merge going forwards. Fantastic. Now that's exciting. We look forward to that. So what are the benefits of merging, let's say, something like DillySim, our liver safety platform, with Gastro Plus? How does it really affect the workflow of, for a user? How does it benefit them? So the, the benefits of, of using something like Gastro Plus, which is a, a sophisticated physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling platform, is that it can predict the most relevant local concentrations in the liver, which can then feed into the, the DSX uh, QST predictions. Also with Gastro Plus, we have the non-oral routes of administration. So we can predict the most relevant local concentrations following say inhalation dosing. Um, and that can then be combined with something like IPF SIM to predict um, following uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So it's getting those most relevant local tissue concentrations and feeding them in to the QST predictions. No, that's great. And I know that from, from the user experiences we have, um, I think, the uh, the convenience of feeding those in uh, automatically rather than manually probably also make it much more fun for the users in terms of uh, less spreadsheets, let's say, in the process and less manual copying and pasting. So that's exciting. For sure, um, yeah. So Neil, now how does Simulations Plus ensure that experienced Gastro Plus users quickly transition to new versions of the software? Um, I guess there's kind of there's, there's three pillars, if I can. Um, to, to that, uh, that question or, or the answer is comprised of, of three pillars. So the first one is that UX design, so the user experience. We're continually striving to make our software platforms as intuitive uh, and as user-friendly as possible so you can get faster up that, that learning curve. So that, that's the first pillar. The second pillar is that we've recently hired into the company uh, a number of individuals that have got vast experience of applying our software within the industry. And so what we're doing internally with that experience is we're testing and we're refining the software from an end user perspective based on you know, years and years, 50 plus years of experience have just come into the company uh, in terms of using Gastro Plus um, within the industry. Uh, and the final pillar is the users ourselves. So what we try to do is have beta um, testing uh, periods of the software where we invite the, the users, the current users to get involved. So they will then get or be able to feed back to us on workflows design. And they also receive some training on the new versions ahead of that full release rolling out. So I know a number of people are worried about switching across to, to GPX from Gastro Plus, but with that sort of three pronged attack, I think it will be a smooth transition. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Neil. And thanks to all of our panelists and participants today. Um, that concludes our primary questions. So I think at this point, we are going to go to some questions to the audience. So um, let's go with let me get to the first question here. Um, are there any plans to release some sort of C++ interface which could allow implementation of a custom toxicity mechanism? but without direct access to the code. So uh, for example, um, let's, let's cut to Scott on this question. Let's say for example, with DillySim, 
Is there uh, plans to release the ability to add something like a mechanism into the code um, that's not already included? And how does that question also relate to on the other side, our QSP platforms? Sure. So um, I, I'm for Delhi Sam and the C++ code base, you know, of course, uh, as Corey showed, every user has the ability to modify parameters and run simulations. And certainly that can, if you have the, the appropriate um, parameter set, you can essentially represent changes to me mechanistic changes that aren't, uh, you know, kind of part of the baseline representation potentially. Uh, as far as kind of writing new code, I, this first re release, DSX, will not have that capability, but that's something we're considering and how to uh, overlay on top of that. Um, and of course, uh, you know, Matt, I think, did a nice job describing how Julia certainly has that capability built into it um, with NAFLD and NASH. There, as opposed to with the drug induced liver injury, I think there's a finite number of potential mechanisms that participate. Hence, kind of a, the, we're able to kind of contain the model a little bit uh, better. Uh, and you know, performance uh, increases. On the Julia side, um, we need to have the flexibility, which it provides to represent all the myriad targets, treatments, et cetera, that are in development presently for NAFLD, NASH and other diseases. Fantastic. And I think there was another aspect to the question, which ultimately, um, I think, ask about SIMPOPs. And the answer is yes, in, the, um, in our platforms, we do, plan to allow for users to create their own custom populations by changing those parameter values that Scott referenced. And in a lot of ways, you can um, alter the underlying biology for those yeah. simulated patients. Um, so Scott, uh, just staying with you for a moment, how about other QSP models that we have in the fold at Simulations Plus? Um, are they going to be uh, migrated to Julia down the road? I, I, you know, our experience thus far with Nappleton has been very encouraging. And I'd say that there's a strong chance of us continuing on with IPF SIM, ILD SIM, and, and beyond. Um, you know, it's kind of step by step, right? Uh, and make sure that everything holds up. Uh, if it does, I see no reason not to. And, and Brett, before I forget about it, um, there's something, you know, as Neil was speaking about DSX and, and or sorry, not DSX, GPX, <clears throat> uh, it, it occurred to me, it's another thing to point out here, because we now have kind of the intersection between NASH and PVPK modeling. Uh, and, you know, the, the biochemical changes due to the pathophysiology of NASH affect um, the ability for the liver to take up and metabolize drugs. So NASH patients tend to have a different sort of um, disposition and, um, you know, the, the PVPK predictability is, is a bit different. And one of the things that we've made a big effort towards recently is to develop a new population of NASH patients within GastroPlus. So now we have, with Nafeldson, the ability to, as I mentioned earlier, accurately predict the response to treatments, and now with Gastro Plus, the disposition of the drug that is driving the response. So put those together, and I think that is a capability that is beyond what is anyone else is able to deliver. Yeah, it sounds like a match made in heaven for sure. All right, Arlene, we're going to turn it back to you. Thanks, Scott, Neil, Matt, and Corey for your participation. Yes, thank you everyone on the panel. Thank you, Brett, and thank you to our audience for joining us. On behalf of Simulations Plus, we invite you to learn more about the software presented uh, on our website, www.simulations-plus.com. And if you have any comments, suggestions, or innovations, improvements, or you want to learn how to be a part of this world-class scientific team, email me at arlene at simulations-plus.com and we will hook you up. We look forward to seeing you for more Tech Talks. The webinar is ended for today, but the replay will be back in the Resource Center tomorrow. Thank you everyone who joined us and we hope to see you soon. Thanks everybody. Bye, thanks.